Anyone looking to explore new career paths in business or grow within an organization should look closely at what Toro College Graduate School of Business has to offer. Academically qualified faculty practitioners who bring real-world experience into the classroom, flexible and accessible class schedules, lifelong career tools with an on-site career resource center, and affordable tuition with low fees. Located in the heart of New York City, Toro College offers hands-on practical training in a full spectrum of business concepts and practices, while also boosting your confidence and fostering leadership C-suite skills. Upon graduation, you are prepared to be practice-ready professionals in your chosen field and have access to top employers as well as valuable networking and internship opportunities. Toro College is a common sense choice for anyone who wants to succeed. To learn more about what Toro College can do for you, visit us online today. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening. We have a wonderful presentation for you on um, blockchain and real estate. A little bit controversial, as you will hear a little bit later on. But before we start the program, I just want to give a brief introduction about who I am and uh, what we do here at Tory University Graduate School of Business. For those of you who um, are interested in learning more about the real estate business, deepen your knowledge about sales, marketing, negotiations, conflict resolution, real estate law, ethics, financing, credit markets, and strategic management, the area of real estate, um, please ask questions, right? I In the chat box, I put um, an email address where you can just ask us about how this will work. We have an advanced certificate in real estate entrepreneurship, uh, which will talk about all these topics. Not only that, we have a wonderful cadre of real estate advisory boards who are here to help students connect them, act as advisors. And of course, let's not forget our speakers, our wonderful guest speakers, such as the one that you'll be hearing tonight. So again, if you have any questions, please um, just drop us a line. Now, for this evening, I want to thank um, our sponsor of this event. It is Midtown Commercial Realty. So I thank you. I also would like to thank uh, Beth Gorin uh, and our Board of Advisors, the Real Estate Board of Advisors, and all those who helped make this possible. But more than that, I'd like to thank these wonderful people that you see in front of you this evening, who've graciously taken up their time to be here to speak to you about this wonderful topic. So I'm just gonna stop talking and let them take it away. But I do wanna introduce you to Duke Long, who's gonna be our moderator for this evening. Duke. Thank you, Mary. I greatly appreciate this opportunity. I think we have an outstanding panel. Uh, real quick, I think we, we mentioned for any questions that you need to put them into the Q&A section down below, not the chat section, the Q&A section. That way Mary can grab them and take them. Uh, real quick, I'm, my name is Duke Long. Uh, I am a longtime broker owner developer. Uh, what I mainly do now is I'm the EIR for Second Century Ventures and Reach, which is part of the NAR. Globally, we have 190 plus companies that we've invested in and all those companies basically are around organized real estate and real estate in general. Uh, I've been doing this kind of thing for about 12 years, and I certainly ha have some opinions about blockchain, so it should get interesting. But what I'd like to do is start off with uh, the panelists and have them introduce themselves. So Ken, please introduce yourself and tell the people who you are and what you do. Well, thanks, Duke. Yeah, my name is Ken Reinhardt, and I'm uh, in Los Angeles, born and raised. I uh, started in commercial real estate in 1992 as a commercial appraiser, uh, then worked for a couple of real estate investment management companies, uh, worked on deals uh, all over the United States. Uh, the biggest deal I've worked on was a portfolio of office properties in Tokyo, of all places. Um, but uh, have experience, a uh, broad range of experience in uh, leasing and asset management, acquisition and disposition. I've worked on the acquisition and disposition of uh, probably about a billion dollars worth of uh, commercial real estate. So, uh, but uh, very, very interested in blockchain and thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Ken, I appreciate it. Uh, Yale, we don't, 
we have an hour and I could go on of all the things you've done, but please introduce yourself and tell the people what you do. Thank you so much, Duke. I'm Yael Tamar. I'm the CEO and co-founder of SolidBlock. SolidBlock is a decentralized finance property ecosystem, which redefines the way we own, use, transfer, and trade property. We started with uh, property tokenization, uh, participating in the first ever commercial real estate deal to be tokenized, which was the St. Regis Aston Ski Resort. And now we are paving the way, becoming the bridge uh, between real estate and decentralized finance. Thank you. Thank you. We have so many questions for you. And last but not least, Kyle. Kyle, please introduce yourself to the people and tell me. Yeah. Thanks so much. I'm Kyle Osman. I live in Orlando, Florida. Um, my past experience, I worked at Goldman Sachs and Duffin Phelps on two separate investment banking teams doing special asset valuation and preparing companies for sell side transactions. Um, after that, I started a boutique firm, BX3 Capital, that was advisory, advising companies in 2018 through 2020 in the blockchain space. Some of them had issued tokens, some of them didn't. And now I run a small venture fund investing in software, blockchain, and technology companies, as well as providing advisory services to a number of investment banks and investment funds on the blockchain space. Thank you, Kyle. So um, again, if you listen to the panelists, we think we know everything, but <laughs> <laughs> I know that I know everything. But we, we should also, we should very much start though, I think with this basic question of, what is blockchain? And I'll throw that out to all three of you and maybe you have your takes on it, but what is your definition of what the blockchain is and what it does? What do you think? Uh, so Duke, I can, I can start, start off. Um, I think it's important for us to understand the history and where blockchain came from and why it was created. And the first obvious use case for blockchain was Bitcoin, which came to the world about 13 years ago. We literally just celebrated the bar mitzvah of Bitcoin. And um, that was revolutionary for several reasons. And the main reason was that for the first time we could transfer funds from one, um, from sender to receiver without a centralized party above uh, the transaction. Meaning you don't, you didn't need a bank to approve the transaction, you didn't need an app like PayPal or Venmo. And, um, and I just wanna illustrate how that works, right? When, let's say I wanna send Duke $200 um, for let's say advisory. Now uh, I, I'm actually in Tel Aviv, Israel right now. And so to send that money, um, it, it will have to go through my bank to another bank, to a few correspondent banks, finally to his bank. Now my bank will withdraw $200 from my account and his bank will add $200 from his account. Now we need the bank in order to be able to do that. And the same thing happens with uh, PayPal, Venmo and other payment apps. Now, Bitcoin was revolutionary because the system as a whole, the system being the blockchain was able to um, to do several things. Number one, agree that the transaction is legitimate, meaning that um, it receives a request from Yael to send money to Duke. Number two, it will verify that I have funds in my wallet and it will, and number three, it will adjust the balance, right? So it will adjust the balance in my wallet and in, in Duke's wallet. So the system is quite sophisticated. So blockchain was a sophisticated way for the system as a whole, um, system co consisting of multiple computers or processors all around the world collectively deciding on, on all these things and also uh, facilitating transactions, meaning that you have to have computing power to facilitate these transactions, right? And of course, the system needs to be paid, right? So there is a transaction fee that's being split between these processors. So that's basically the blockchain. The blockchain is immutable. Uh, it, can, it cannot be adjusted by uh, or changed by any one actor. It has to be adjusted in a consensus um, or changed in a consensus with, with the rest of the, uh, of the system um, uh, systems processors, right? So it's immutable. You cannot change it individually. Um, it's, it's, uh, it has different blockchains have different um, 
uh, have different uh, pros and cons, right? Beyond Bitcoin blockchain, which was the first, then it was Ethereum and many others. And um, now blockchain is used for many other things, right? So transactions, sending information, but just remember it's a decentralized way to send, uh, to send transactions and it's immutable. Thanks. That's perfect. Kyle, is there anything you'd like to add on to that at, at all? Mm -hmm. No, I think I think she hit on hit the nail on the head on you know one one other thing that I might add right now um, specifically to Bitcoin and a number of other cryptocurrencies is we're seeing rapid inflation, which is affecting the real estate market um, quite a bit. Is that one of the cool things about Bitcoin and some of the other cryptocurrencies out there is that there's a finite supply of it, so they can't j just be more Bitcoin printed. There's 21 million Bitcoins and that's it. So another really cool thing with cryptocurrency more so than the blockchain is that it's a finite limited supply so it's really inflation resisted um where a lot of the, a lot of other assets are not and yeah i think we had a conversation beforehand that to kind of make sure you define blockchain is blockchain and crypto is crypto right can you kind of put a fine point on that for us Sure. So crypto is a, is very simply cryptocurrencies. The very simple is a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a currency. You use it to uh, either uh, for transactions, meaning pay um, individuals or, or companies. And um, you can also use it as a store of value, right? So Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies have been appreciating for some time. So um, a lot of the investors who use them as a store of value, right? So transaction a store of value capability. Now, a blockchain is simply a ledger. It's, it's a, a technological platform and infrastructure to facilitate cryptocurrencies. Beyond cryptocurrencies, there are also uh, other types of cryptographic tokens, right? So there are tokens that, that have some sort of a inherent function. So um, security tokens, for example, have a function that um, they denote um, that basically some sort of an asset-backed uh, uh, in financial instruments. So behind security token, there is actually some sort of a, a real world or maybe a digital asset. And then there's other types of tokens like utility tokens. So I'm not going to go into different types, but so that you guys know the main things are cryptocurrency, then tokens. And of course, tokens include NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And we'll maybe talk about those later. But blockchain is what enables for these things to exist. Wonderful. All right, Ken, we're the real estate people on here. Not that the other two aren't, but I think us old dudes have some depth. So give me some ideas about blockchain and real estate. And I know you have some, and I certainly have some, but why would I use blockchain for real estate? And maybe why would I not use blockchain for real estate? Why are you here to, to kind of emphasize? Yeah, some of great question. Um, I, I go back to the economic principle that uh, the, the market is always going to seek uh, efficiency, okay? Uh, you know, great example, Henry Ford, uh, the, his cars were uh, successful because he created an efficient platform for production. And there are a lot of people that touch a real estate transaction. Some for the better, some are, you know, can be done away with. And so what, what I see blockchain doing is creating an efficiency in the market where, say, for example, you know, like I said earlier, the, uh, you know, I did a lot of, uh, I've done a lot of acquisition and disposition of commercial real estate. And so I would put in an offer on a property and, uh, you know, offer accepted i get the uh you know the the leases and everything and and i would throw away the offering memorandum which had brokers information about what the income and expenses are and then i would dig into the actual leases that say okay well this is what really is going on the same with the cash flow uh so if all that information is stored on a blockchain one, like uh, Yael said, uh, it's immutable. In other words, it can't be changed. Uh, and so uh, 
if uh, you replace a uh, uh, an HVAC unit, uh, you know you can put that information in, you know, in stored in the property records. So it creates a transparency that uh, currently I wouldn't say it's not available, but it's not as readily available. Uh, without doing a tremendous amount of research, uh, due diligence periods uh, are typically at least 45 days to do, you know, uh, books and records and and uh, uh, physical inspection. Whereas if all that information is stored in a common repository, in this case, a, a blockchain, uh, that it speeds up the process. So that's just kind of a one use connect one use right. scenario. And and I could debate that a little bit because what are we doing now that's not efficient enough or not a good database of? I realize we could have some transparency. And I'm not being anti your comment. Uh, no, no, I no, do no. want to go to I do I want to go to Kyle. I want to go to Kyle and then I'll go to Yale. Kyle, tell me a little bit more about what you see as the reality today of blockchain you mentioned this of what what what's some of the things that are that are going on and what's some of the things that are not going on with yeah well i think blockchain. one of the things that's most important to remember and people kind of get caught up in the blockchain just like they did in ai before the blockchain is not necessarily everything needs to be on the blockchain or involved with the blockchain not everything needs to be tokenized um but i think one of two one of the two best things i see in the real estate space is title registries I think the whole title process of real estate is completely outdated and archaic. And to be able to have those titles on a blockchain that are easily easy to look up and easy to transfer, um, I think that's something that's a huge innovation and can save people a lot of costs when it comes to closing on either commercial properties or you know just regular home buying. So I think that's you know one of them. And the other is tokenized assets. So Yale mentioned um, she was involved with the first ever tokenized property, the St. Regis and Aspen. I think that you know tokenization for fractional ownership can be a really interesting method of transacting you know real estate space where people want to invest and want to get involved um, without having to buy a whole property or being a part of an LP. I yeah. actually okay. see, if I may disagree with you, Kyle. I, I actually see land registry, particularly here in the United States, as as the last thing that will be on a blockchain. You've got hundreds and hundreds of counties, all with different types of, of land registries. Uh, so there, there's, it, there's no one size fits all for, uh, for, for title registry. Uh, I think the, the potential more is actually in third world countries where uh, there's little to no land registry so that they could start from scratch and free up what is what we call dead capital, which is, you know, say a farmer in, you know, whatever country, as, you know, he knows he owns the property down to the oak tree and up to the river and everybody knows that, but he can't borrow against that because there's no title. There's the, the title is weak. So I think it's a, it, it can be a means of freeing up dead capital in third world countries, but I don't see it. I think that's going to be one of the last things we see uh, in the United States. All right, let so, me get to, okay, you guys, very valid points. Uh, we could talk about title for about another half hour. I certainly could in transactional things. So one of the things I think about when, again, we've invested in, did I say 190 plus companies, are we investing in the platform that's going to be usable in the next three, five, 10 years, because we're, we're using platforms right now that were built, what, five, 10, 15 years before this, right? So to you, Yale, since you are not only have one now, I certainly know that you're building one for the future. Uh, talk a little bit about what you have, why you built it, um, and, and how it has, in your mind, how it has that practical use, I'm literally today and three to five years out. Great, so thanks for that question, Duke. So our motivation to tokenize real estate was to provide sponsors or real estate developers, anybody involved in real estate with, a, with another instrument, right? Today's options for investors, right? Um, to invest in property 
range from buying a house, going on one of the crowdfunding platforms, you know, where they'll they'll see a variety of commercial assets, right? So we're we're in that space. We're within that space, right? Um, however, we really wanted to kind of level the playing field and let people invest in landmark assets, very high quality of assets, institutional level assets. However, when you invest in those assets, your money is locked up for five to seven years, maybe even more, right? So Aspen Coin, uh, the, the main reason why Aspen Coin was tokenized is because investors knew that this asset is not going anywhere. Nobody's selling it <laughs> anytime soon. And they wanted to see their money back in their lifetime. So um, the, the motivation for tokenizing real estate is to give investors a way to capitalize on their investments early and shorten the periods of, of, of investment lockup. So specifically with Aspen Coin, as, as it was listed on an exchange, uh, investors were able to get around 20% annual return on their investment, those that sold be, uh, in just a year and a half. Why? Because instead of waiting for seven years, they just waited for a year and a half. So that's the main motivation for what we did up until today. We're evolving into now more into a liquidity space. And um, in three to five years, <laughs> we're going to see things that are totally uh, different because the industry of blockchain, as you know, is going uh, is evolving really, really fast. Yeah, very, very much. And to to kind of round it out, we, we invested in a company that does similar things to what you do. Mm -hmm. And the reason we invested in them in a simple way is to go back to your point. Somebody has four or five buildings and they've got it. Let's use a million dollars in it. How do they actually get that out? The way real estate is set up today, it, you just can't. And what if you have partners? What if you want your aunt who divorced your uncle out of there? Well, good luck getting them out of there. So there's a there's a lot of things. That's an actual practical thing that that we had to deal with. So I, I completely get that part of it. So Ken, let me go back to you real quick. Um, since since there's so much quality, in my opinion, structure around commercial real estate and real estate in general, because if we didn't have that, then we it'd be you know a free for all. What what do you see as some of the obstacles right now in organized real estate to not so much adoption of blockchain, but uh, the advancement of commercial real estate along with blockchain? Um, I think, first of all, it's a mindset of, you know, I think there's the uh, the Bitcoin hangover, so to speak. People think think blockchain, they think Bitcoin, and it's a wild, wild, wild west. Um, but to me, it, I think the, uh, uh, wait a minute, what was the question? <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> so what are what are the obstacles? Uh, what are the obstacles, barriers to adoption? Yes. So and um, somebody somebody really smart popped my question in there. I had it first, by the way, Christopher. Okay, you're listening. <laughs> thank you. It was a really good so question. I, I think yeah. So uh, the mental block, but also the uh, yeah. What people don't realize is that uh, blockchain requires a tremendous amount of computing power. Uh, and with computing power uh, requires a lot of electricity. So it's, uh, those are, those are uh, big obstacles that we're going to have to overcome. Uh, also bandwidth and uh, storage. So, but if we just concentrate on the, the, uh, the necessary computing power, uh, there's there's a lot of computing power that's that's required, and it's not like you can just uh, you know it's not like the the days of Napster where you can just put it on your laptop or whatever and trade music and whatever. Uh, these are very specialized computers, and you need banks and banks of them in order to uh, process these uh, app these uh, um, these transactions. So Kyle, you mentioned something about, you know, the kind of the scope at the beginning of there's only so many Bitcoin, there are only so many X and X. You can only buy so much space next to Snoop Dogg's house in the metaverse. And if you're doing that, you got way too much money in your life, but that's just my opinion. Um, and, and good for you, because God knows it'll be worth a million. But give me an idea, in your opinion, of the economics of this. When I ask you that question, I'm asking about 
only so many people can own Bitcoin, right? And as we know, only a certain 1% of people own the Bitcoin. So how does the economics flow out? And I'll go to you after this a little bit, Neil, too. How do the economics flow out and what's practical where somebody can start investing in this stuff? Do you, how are you kind of looking at that? And are you investing in companies that are scaling out like that? I think my question is more about scale as much as it is economics. Yeah, so I think the scale potential potential is enormous, right? I think we we can you can go to coinmarketcap.com and follow the market cap of all cryptocurrencies combined, which kind of is a good barometer of the growth of the space as the market cap increases. But I think the space is just enormous because we're in the United States. I don't actually know that Bitcoin's strongest and best use case is in the United States. I think it's in places like, you know, right now, Russia, Venezuela, um, places where, you know, the con currencies are have been severely devalued or severely manipulated. I mean, there's been tons and tons of polling done. People in, you know, in more de most so developing countries would much rather own Bitcoin than they would their nation state currency. So I think a lot of the development as, you know, as a currency and for the ecosystem is going to be internationally versus, you know, in the U.S. I mean, we, we can just, you know, kind of refute my point about title and he thinks it's going to be more so in third world and developing countries that they're going to put together land registries. So I think a lot of the growth of blockchain is going to be outside of the U.S. versus inside. And I think that the regulatory climate we've had um, has not been friendly to it. And I think that's going to continue to push a lot of innovation offshore. But I think this is one of the true things that's really a global phenomenon. It's not focused in any one country or nation. And that's why I think the potential of it's so large. Well, and software has no Can borders, add right? To that? There are no borders. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um... What Kyle is saying is, so I was on a on a webinar a couple of months ago. Uh, Yael, I think you might have been on that one too, where it was about blockchain and real estate. And I hit, I'm looking at my notes. I, I jotted down some of the countries as fast as I could write. Uh, people literally from all over the world: Amsterdam, Vancouver, British Columbia, Brazil, Nigeria, New York, Texas, San Diego, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, uh, Australia. I mean, this is a global movement, and uh, it's it's happening. And uh, there's there's a lot of people, literally all over the world, working on blockchain and real estate. So to to you, Yale, um, if, if we're going to do this globally, right, then there has to be a certain standard. And who defines that standard? I certainly think it could be me. But how, how are we how are we going to be in different countries, different municipalities? Of course, I think about the United States where you have the federal, the state, the local, the municipality, the government, you know, it drills all the way down with title and all that kind of stuff. So how are you addressing the issue of standardization. Are you defining a standard at solid block? I think I can answer that question. I think so. But how are you addressing that broader issue? With And, and I guess it's a two-part question. And then how are you attracting investors of all these types? I mean, how are you doing that? I'd be fascinated to find out how you're doing that. So this is such an important question. So number one, we are all bound, you know, in the, in the financial space, in the fintech space, anywhere around the world, we're bound by the rules of the financial authorities. So in the United States, that would be the SCC, right? So the SCC governs how uh, one can so sell securities, how one can solicit investors, how one can, um, will need to comply with different rules and regulations, right? In different countries, you have uh, counterparties of the SCC. So um, now, first and foremost, um, the SCC has been uh, working for um, the last 10 years on defining how we treat cryptocurrencies even, right? So whether Bitcoin is an asset or a currency, how you tax Bitcoin, how you transfer Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that are similar to Bitcoin. Uh, what is, you know, whether or not something is a cryptocurrency or a security, right? Which is like a famous case for XRP um, happening right now uh, in the courts. So uh, that's first and foremost. So Salablog has determined that we actually have several products. We have security products and non-security products. Anything, and, and just as a disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer nor a financial advisor. 
but you know, I've been in the space long enough to kind of be 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 well versed in this in in this thing, and you kind of have to. Um, so when we sell asset backed securities and anything in a fractional format, in a fractional form, fraction of an asset is certainly a security, then we have to comply with the SEC rules. That's first and foremost. However, on top of that, there are certain standards that Salablog does uh, establish. And these standards have to deal with, you know, how do we actually create the blockchain mechanism for transfer of property? Um, so there's some standards that are already on the blockchain. So the first one that we have created in the industry was called an ERC-20 standard, which is an Ethereum standard um, for transferring tokens. So ours had compliance that's embedded in it, meaning you couldn't transfer this token to anyone unless they went through some uh, rigorous uh, know your customer procedures and anti-money laundering, right? So if they didn't go through that, then they couldn't buy the token. So that was kind of the first revolution that Solidblock was a part of, right? So we, we created the first standard. And then there is another company that was quite successful called TokenSoft. They updated our standard, created a new standard. And then we keep going back and forth, right? So we keep taking theirs and updating it because times go on, technology improves. So tech standard, right? Now there's also a business standard. So what are other things that we as Solidblock can provide to both investors and sponsors to make everybody feel more comfortable with blockchain, right? So we try to make our process as similar as you would do in a traditional securities offering, right? Um, so we update the private place in the memorandum and all of this stuff, legal and tech. So, you know, there, this is a very, very long conversation. I don't want to bore anyone. If anybody is interested about it, we have time. <laughs> Keep going. Just just go on our on our website or talk to me, and I'll be happy. Uh, I'll be happy to kind of expand on on those on those standards that we establish. All right. So, Kyle, let me talk to you about tokens. Uh, I did an ICO way back in the day, um, which was I don't know, you know, about an hour ago for crypto. So, uh, there's so many tokens out there, so many different things. And I'm going back to a little bit of scale and standard, right? Where Yale is creating a standard for her company, this token, this X. How do you think, this is a broad question, and are you investing in, how do you think people can get there? And are there some, in your opinion, that are either there now or are the ones that are going to be, that should be looked at closely? Yeah, so we primarily invest in Bitcoin um, with a number of arbitrage strategies and long short strategies. So that's primarily what we do. But I think there's going to be a lot of tokens that are going to be winners and there's going to be a lot of tokens that are losers. I think one of the things that Yale does and does well is she's an asset backed tokens, which makes a lot of sense. Um, a lot of the ICOs in the early days were trying to skirt security laws by pretending that they weren't a security, even though they had, we had, we had nothing behind it without a doubt. It was, it was BS. I'm just being honest about it. So very good point. Please keep going. Yeah. I mean, most of them were just a mechanism to raise capital without anything behind them. I said a true utility token. Um, and there's, you know, there's really going to be two types, utility and security, and there's stable coins, which we can get to at a later point. But a true utility token should function much like a gift card. If a company is going to sell you, sell, you know, sell the right to buy something at a later time, um, you know, at your discretion, it's really a gift card. It should, you know, it should be booked as an account. You know, they, they get capital in and it's account payable. It's it's something that's on the balance sheet, similar to how gift cards are held. It shouldn't be held as a security. It shouldn't be used to, to generate revenue. Um, so I think that, you know, there's a lot wrong with the first way tokens were offered. And we're really right waiting on a regulatory framework so tokens can be launched the proper way. As I, I just don't think there's been a robust market yet for security tokens. It's really just been Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and that's why we've stayed mostly in Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, when we did the ICO, we got $4 million in like a day and a half, right? And it was in with Ethereum where we traded that. Then I got Ethereum for it. And like a fool, I sold it. And we all have those, all those stories, you know. So that's all it was at that time. And I think we have evolved beyond that, right? Where there's more, I don't know what the word I want to use, maybe more faith in, in the value of it. Because the only value you have in a token is one other person thinks there's value and you think there's value, right? To a certain extent. Now that you have an yeah. asset back token, that's a little bit different to your point, right? Well, now it has an asset value. We're the only real estate is the only thing that wraps technology around a physical structure. So keep going. I think 
I think one of the things that people can look at and one of the things I follow closely for the growth of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and as an asset class is the movement of Bitcoin when the stock market, the tech market has a rough day. Right now, Bitcoin trades with almost a 90% correlation to the NASDAQ, um, where, you know, in theory, it should trade close, closer to gold if it's viewed as a store of value um, and, you know, kind of a digital gold. But right now it's viewed as a risk asset instead of a store of value in a currency. So I'm waiting for that correlation to diminish um, before you can really call Bitcoin a currency, you know, by, by a global standard. Say that's why Goldman Sachs hired you. You know what I'm saying? Now we know why you're here. That's excellent. That's, that's the de definition of, right? The market has to, to mature a little bit and we have to get beyond that. So Ken, let me, let me come to you um, on, on the real estate, real estate side. We talk about tokenization. We talk about transactional. If I am one of your building owners where you're doing dispositions or whatever, what should I be paying attention to with this stuff right now? Oh, it's the hot thing. It's the happening thing. And I, I mentioned Snoop Dogg has got a house and my grandson's got a thing. So I should pay an attention, right? And I've said this a hundred times, if it were something real and practical, Blackstone and Brookfield would be all over it, right? The people with the buildings and the money would be down and going after it. So give me your take on what that building owner or that asset owner that you've been around should be looking at right now and kind of looking at in the future. I think it's liquidity. Um, so, uh, you know, you, Say you, uh, you know, I, I give the example. Uh, okay, are you talking about somebody that's acquiring a property or currently owns a property? Both. Both. So, Buy side and uh, sell side. Um, well, okay. There's there's a third, and that's a, the person that uh, has the property and ha has no intention on selling, but. You know, they could sell a portion of it, just kind of like what uh, what the, they did with Aspen. So you, it, it builds in a liquidity that is currently unavailable. Uh, you know, with uh, with with fractional ownership, say I uh, I own you know I have a half a million dollars tied up in a in an asset. And uh, I get a huge medical bill, and I got to pay it, you know, hundred thousand dollars towards a medical bill or whatever. Right now, uh, to sell a portion of my equity, I'm going to take a hit. Okay, because people aren't going to pay a hundred thousand dollars for a hundred thousand dollars worth of equity. They're just not going to do it. it yeah, you know, they're so. If the if the property is tokenized. And you have the ability to uh, sell off just a hundred thousand dollars. You can't do that right now. But with with uh, and I'm not saying that it's like this right now. But in the near future, I see you know a, a trading platform where you can go in and offer up that hundred thousand dollars worth of equity, and there you know you could have. A hundred buyers, you know. What if, each what if you had that on a Nasdaq right now? So, what if you could do that on a Nasdaq right now? Is that is that what you're talking about? Yeah, some sort of a like a, a, a trading platform. Yeah, it already right. exists. It already yeah. exists. So you can go do that. The issue is back to my kind of the point of my original question. We're going back to scale. So if 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 I'm with Yale and Solid Block and she can offer me four buildings couple in Harlem and one in Brooklyn and one over in Queens. That's great. But that's only four, right? That's not a thousand. I want to have a choice. I want those buildings to compete. So why, again, there's another obstacle of how do we get to that level of scale? And you know where I'm going with this, Yale. How do you define that? Because if she's got a hundred buildings on her platform, she could be making some money, right? And God, she made a nice little business and that's wonderful. God bless. But what is yeah. scale? Is it is it time? Is it a long term thing? Is it going to be fifty years before we get every building on? So that's kind of what I'm at. Why should these building owners be paying attention to this? So do you, right. do you yeah? What do you think about scale? And if I'm that building owner, what should I be looking at? Great question. Uh, For, no, no, my fifty billion, fifty billion dollar question. Um, so number one, I kind of want to address what you said earlier. Why isn't uh, why aren't big institutions, uh, you know, all over this technology? Well, number one, it takes them some time. 
um, you know, institutions uh, took about three to four years to get into crypto, and now every single one is in crypto, right? Um, so, uh, and the reason was, uh, if there were a few reasons. One is the lack of understanding of the market, lack of analysts. So, you know, they're scrambling for staff, lack of data, right? So data points. Uh, how can they uh, trade it? How can they evaluate it? And so on, right? So we, we're seeing the same thing around the technology surrounding security tokens. So that's the first point. The second point, um, yes, NASDAQ has, specifically there is a startup that, that NASDAQ is associated with called Lex Markets. And now they're, um, uh, now they're actually trading or poised to trade uh, real estate um, securities not blockchain based, but just regular securities on NASDAQ. Now, why is this not interesting in my opinion? Just like you said, you know, there's a few buildings trading. Will there be trading? Do people really care about really buying shares of, of specific buildings and then selling them? Do they know anything about those buildings? How can they evaluate whether those buildings are gonna go up or down in value, right? Especially if they're smaller assets, maybe up to 20, maybe even up to $50 million in value. How, you know, is anybody gonna care? Is it similar to small cap stocks? Yes, if you have some sort of an un unobscure company that went public on some sort of a marketplace, is it gonna have liquidity? No, it will not. Who will have liquidity? The Amazons, the Facebook, the Googles of the world. So what is the equivalent of the Amazon, the Facebook, and the Google in the real estate space? Well, number one, landmark assets, right? So the likes of the Aston St. Regis, you know, if you, if you put Empire State Building on it, I'm sure everybody's going to be all over it, right? That's number one. Number two, portfolios of assets. So we encourage clients to put their whole portfolio, which is going you know, across a specific sector or an industry, right? So maybe warehouses, maybe medical real estate, maybe commercial with a specific profile, right? Because those you know, investors are bullish at some point or maybe bearish on different industries, right? At a certain, at a certain point in the cycle, there's always a cycle going on in specific types of real estate. So it has to be done smart. These products are at the end of the day, just products. Securities represent the underlying product. Is this underlying product interesting to anybody? So that's a million dollar question. And the final thing which, where I see the industry going is aggregation. So funds of funds, index funds, right? Kind of aggregated funds that will be first and foremost accessible to institutions and then maybe through ETFs, to, through electronically traded funds to uh, accredited or maybe even retail investors. Those things are going to see liquidity and then the liquidity will trickle down to individual projects. Perfect. All right, within the, uh, the confines of time, uh, I need to throw it back to Mary so she can take over. And if there's any questions, we can use the last few minutes to have some yeah, questions. Yes, there are a bunch you. of questions here on uh, on Zoom. So. Um, yes, so thank you. Yes, I want to address some of the questions as promised earlier. So please feel free to go in the Q&A section, right, and type in your question. And we'll try to get through as many as we can. Okay, so Christopher says, well, I posit that little processes and data and blockchain would work well together and that the difference between counties could be more easily accommodated with blockchain technology than many existing data systems in place. The barriers to adoption wouldn't be the technology architecture or implementation. It would be the existing organizations resisting change to protect their current models. Thoughts? Is that a question? Uh, yeah, I totally no, it agree. it's not a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was yeah, my totally two cents they said. The answer is yes. Is, we know that. Somebody who's tried to get plans through plan check, oh, I can tell goodness. you, you know, and I not to be- stories for days. You know, yeah, I, I, this is like government, you know, I hate to generalize, but it's generally true because I've worked on with many municipalities and, and government agencies to try to get something through approval and plan check or whatever uh they there are fiefdoms and it, it's just you know i i can tell you stories about trying to get things done I, I remember well anyway that's that is a big hurdle is and like i said earlier about the uh you know you got literally hundreds of counties 
and in the United States and, and tried to create a, the same platform for all counties. Uh, I, I don't know. That. Let me address that, that comment like this though. So every, you know, everyone's protecting the little fiefdoms, everyone's protecting their business model. Is it gonna be better if we make it more efficient and all the bank and all the money goes into his account, right? Does that make it better? That makes it better for me, right? Does that mean that we've made it more efficient? We don't have to have all those layers, but I get all the money, right? So maybe, is that decentralization? Maybe we already have decentralization, right? Where it's spread out and you don't have just one big monster thing that I own all the title, which is kind of what we have a little bit now. So that's always been my issue with part of the community that's around blockchain and real estate. They want to transfer all the wealth to them. That's all they want to do, right? As long as it goes from those old white dudes to my bank account, that's saving the world. Absolutely, right? Oh, Come on, I'm an old white dude. I can say whatever really. I want. Yeah, not really. Think so? Uh, Come on. That, that, was, that was sarcastic, right? That's my point. It's sarcastic. They think as long as that's a better thing. This. Everybody in business goes into a business because they think they have a better way of doing something or a better product, better service. And of course they want their, the money to go into their account. So unless we abandon capitalism altogether, then, then yeah, there are gonna be people that put up the time and energy and money to create these systems. Of course, they're gonna to wanna to return on investment. Profit maximization is what's being taught, right? Um, What's that? Know, I, I said profit maximization is the number one exactly. thing to any business, right? Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm I'll give you an easier. World. I'm sorry, Duke. Go ahead. No, I said I'm trying to save the world. I'm not trying to make it. <laughs> I'll ask it maybe an easier question now instead of a thought. Okay. So George writes Does blockchain go hand in hand with Bitcoin? Can you use blockchain technology without using Bitcoin? Yes, you certainly yes. can. Two different things. Yes. There are many, many types of, of blockchains. Uh, Bitcoin is one type of blockchain. Okay, next question. Um, the, um, I'd be curious to hear the panelists comment on Propy, P-R-O-P-Y. I Does like Propy. Uh, the CEO is my friend, Natalia. I, I like what they're doing. So it, it, it actually, they started with um, Tidal. So they, they were going to tackle the, the, the title registry and they, they had a successful use case in some county in the, in the Western US, but they didn't have, I guess they didn't have a buy-in from the relevant stakeholders to, to push this through. So they, they pivoted into an NFT space where they're assisting agents, really real estate agents in and conducting transactions, um, uh, real estate transactions via NFT. So, um, you know, personally, I think that they have a, a long road ahead of them, but, you know, that shouldn't stop anybody <laughs> from doing it. Right. And <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and I think that uh, definitely the, the real estate transactions uh, in the U.S. specifically are very long and convoluted and, and you know, take a, take a lot of energy and time uh, I think that the agents and even escrow agents can can probably put their uh, time to a better use to locate the best properties out there for an individual. And, and these um, kind of transactional issues could be left to the blockchain because that's what the blockchain was born to do. So uh, another question that kind of maybe follows up on that is, is attorneys have an ethical obligation to ensure that the interest on down payments are properly accounted for. Can you touch upon how attorney escrow accounts will be affected by the use of cryptocurrency in residential or commercial transactions in light of the fluctuations in value? Wow. Um, I think <laughs> it's a very, it's a, it's like a very loaded question here because there's lots yeah. of different moves. Right. But let's just, let's just discuss escrow so, for a minute. Yeah. Who's, who's, who's speaking? Maybe you have. No. So no, no, no. Kyle, one okay, of the go attorneys ahead. actually asked that, posed that question. Yeah, yeah. Kyle, uh, maybe Kyle has an answer. Yeah, so oh. there's so there's two separate ways I've seen it done. I've seen a couple of different um, 
eight figure real estate transactions go through with cryptocurrency. So one is to use a stable coin such as USDC um, or Tether, something that's that's pegged to the dollar or pegged to a certain dollar amount, um, which is much less fluctuation in price. And the other way to do it is to price the deal in Bitcoin. So let's say a deal is for 44 Bitcoin. Um, the deals, you know, people transact in, in Bitcoin instead of transacting in USD or euros or pounds, um, just doing the transaction on a set amount of Bitcoin. And the fluctuation is what the fluctuation is, but you're, you're getting the same amount of Bitcoin in the transaction, no matter what. Um, so those are the two ways I've seen it done to try and kind of get around, um, Mm -hmm. to try and kind of get around to a degree of the issues with escrow. That's awesome. Yeah. So that, I just want to add quickly to that. Um, so we did, we assisted um, in a condo transaction of $22 million in Miami where a buyer was uh, sending money in Bitcoin and the seller was getting it in fiat. Now, um, there is a two-step process, right? And which makes everything difficult. And there is a, 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 you know, you have to put the down payment in escrow. And then when the deal is taking place, that's when, you know, it could take a few days or weeks, and that's when the Bitcoin fluctuation really affects, or crypto fluctuation can really affect the price, right? Because if you have to give back the down payment, then it's worth a completely different amount of money. So nowadays, we just ask people to use stablecoin, as Kyle said, to avoid that. But really, you don't need to necessarily break the, the, break the uh, transaction into two parts, as in down payment and post payment, because you now have smart contracts on blockchain that can replace the escrow processes. So that's that's a way blockchain can can help. Yeah. Great. Next question. How would you expect the properties to be valued? Valuations are generally done quarterly or yearly. Liquidity you are mentioning is daily. Comment? Yeah, so I, I feel as though if something's an asset that's marked to market on a daily basis, like on a security token exchange, then the market would dictate the value. And there actually wouldn't be a need for an independent valuation, um, such as they're for like shares in a private company, like companies prior to issuing shares are usually on an annual basis, will get a 409A valuation, which is, you know, kind of a valuation for a company that's not public and isn't valued by the market. But if you have assets that are valued on the market on a daily basis, then you can just, you don't really, it eliminates the need for evaluation because they're valued by the market daily. Great. Okay, we have a couple of more questions, if you don't mind. Um, okay, the next question comes from Scott, and he says, kindly educate me regarding benefits of this leading edge technology versus conventional financing closing of the capital stock. I think, Gail, yeah, you may have mentioned that already, but I don't know if you want to. Benefits of technology versus financial, conventional financial. Cl- right. oh, okay, okay, I got you. Versus conventional so, financing. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, now I understand. So, um, so first of all, uh, the capital stack itself, the cap table right now, if you are doing a private offering, uh, it, it could be held somewhere in a database with, by a lawyer, by a law office. You may use Carta or you may use an Excel spreadsheet, right? So different companies use different things, right? So uh, with a blockchain ledger, it's immutable. It's, um, it, you know, it's not prone to mistakes. That's number one. And number two, you have a compliant way to enable peer-to-peer sale, right, of, of these securities. So your capital stack is sitting on the blockchain, meaning that when an investor comes and puts the money in through a smart contract, they automatically get a certain number of these digital securities, i.e. shares. And then they, these shares are held in their wallet, right? They, they can self-custody or they can use uh, professional custody. Um, and, and now these shares are tra- can be tradable, right? So you can transfer them to others. So imagine reduction of a headache where investors go to the sponsor and say, I, I really want out. Can you have somebody buy my, my shares? So that's one thing. So you get the flexibility of the capital stack. Uh, again, the tokenized shares could be just a layer of a capital stack. You don't have to, ca- you don't have to tokenize the whole cap stack. Just tokenize a class of shares or get a feeder fund going. So I hope that answers these questions, Scott. Wonderful. Um, next question. It says, in 2018, 
Nautil was positioning itself as a blockchain-based CRE tech platform. Their current website has no mention of blockchain. Any thoughts on this? Is blockchain still mm. too early for CRE to establish real I revenue? I think in 2018, a lot of businesses try to position themselves as blockchain driven businesses. And the reality is for some, as I said earlier, it just didn't function into their business model and others, it's just you know too cost prohibitive or didn't make sense or the technology wasn't there at the time. So uh, maybe somebody else can speak more ex you know, specifically to Notel, but I know you know, I there's a host a of bit. companies out there that have fallen into that bucket. So yeah, I wanna tell a little bit about Notel. We did an event with them right when COVID started, when COVID hit in 20, when was it, 2020? Uh, and literally we did an event on what's going to happen to office spaces when, mm -hmm. because of COVID, right? And that point we were like, oh, COVID's going to last for two months, three months, four months, and then we're going to go back to normal. And Nautel, of course, provided flexible open spaces at that time, right? So literally uh, a few weeks after that webinar that we did, they announced like a big layoff, you know, and just, you know, obviously office spaces are um, have create, you know, uh, we, we know what happened. We know what happened yeah. to them. This but is being no recorded, right? It's being recorded. Here's my answer. Yeah. The CEO yeah. wore too many reared fedoras and velvet slippers to really focus on what was important. That was for you, Yale. I know you know that. That's an yeah. inside joke. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Anyway, I think I think that um, uh, CRE, actually the question I think is more about is the CRE uh, tech space uh, open to blockchain and ready for blockchain. blockchain. And look at the number of startups that Duke uh, Duke's <laughs> company has invested, investment company invested in. Look at the number of startups that Kyle's right. company invested in, and 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 how many of them are in blockchain space. I think it's more than ready. So okay, the next question: yeah. With Fannie Mae and Freddie eliminating appraisal and moving to desktop underwriting, don't feel value uh, would be an issue. What do you think? Say that again. Yes, with the, the with Fanny and Freddie, right? Eliminating appraisal and moving to desktop underwriting. Well, desktop take as somebody who's done a ton of desktop underwriting. That's what we're trying to do is get to evaluation. Right. So I, I think it's just taking a different form of valuation what, instead of long, and I'm just coming at it from a commercial standpoint, not residential, but uh, commercial uh, instead of a, you know, a long, big, thick, you know, 100 page narrative appraisal, I, I think they're going, is, if what you're saying, if I'm understanding you right, they're just going to, uh, you know, maybe just a like a d discounted cash flow or something. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the, but desktop underwriting is valuation. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah I've never I seen have... an appraisal, a 38 page appraisal that couldn't be done in 10 pages that the appraiser makes sure it's still 30. So <laughs> we can probably already be there. As somebody okay. who used to work on those, uh, it's basically uh, covering yourself from liability. Yeah. Uh -huh. right, yeah, right. that's the point. Okay. Will the blockchain one, eliminate? Yeah. Sorry. One more quick question. Uh, could a DAO be feasible model for setting standards? Yeah. As long as they're cheating and scamming, right? Isn't that what a DAO is for? To eliminate. And I think that's part of the definition of doing that. You got to scam everybody to prove that you're legit. Ooh. How's that? That's my opinion, Yale. Just, just giving it out. <laughs> So first of all, DAO, Decentralized uh, Autonomous Organization, is a way to have to run a group, either an organization or a company, without in a decentralized manner, where you can uh, get some opinion, uh, you can get some decisions made in uh, through through a consortium. Uh, it has its place, um, and I, I, um, I don't know what the question was. The DAO for what? Um, for, I'm sorry, I was trying to read the other questions that were coming up. I apologize about that. Well, while you're finding that- A, I a feasible model for setting standards. 
Oh, absolutely. It's already been done and it's, it's getting done, done right now. I think it's not too bad for standards. Um, I want to touch a little bit on underwriting because I, I know you're talking about insurance underwriting and blockchain could help with uh, with that, but I also want to uh, uh, touch on on underwriting, financial underwriting, underwriting financial risk, mm -hmm. and that's something that SolidBlock is doing next. So Duke asked me about what's going to be big in the next two three years. I believe that fractional underwriting for financial risk, just like in IPOs, you have let's say an investment bank like J.P. Morgan underwriting an IPO and getting fees for that. We're establishing fractional underwriting for private offerings where any investor can be an underwriter and any investor can can get can take the financial risk and get the fees from the system for that. Well, I wanna be very mindful of the time. So do you have two more minutes for one or two more questions or should we call it a wrap as they say? Okay, so let's let's call it let, let's call it a wrap. But I want to be mindful of everyone's time. I want to thank everyone for being here. Do You're very welcome. And Yale, thank Kyle, you. wonderful. Thank you. And of course, I want to once it was again, fun. It was fun. I know. I want to thank the Midtown <laughs> Commercial Realty for sponsoring this event. My wonderful uh, board of advisors. Um, uh, let's see, Beth Gorman, who has helped my. Um, of course, my staff members and all, if you have any questions about anything that we've said here and done, please feel free to reach out to the Graduate School of Business at gradbusiness at toro.edu. We'd love to talk to you and explore different possibilities, okay? Thank you all again for joining. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it and we hope to do this again. Okay. Thank you, Mary. You're wonderful. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.